Right. Well, good to be with you, church. It uh, has been a couple weeks since I've been up here. I'm grateful for uh, our missions partner. Just so happens to be my dad, who uh, has been filling in for me. We are going to jump back into our Acts series this morning. So if I were to ask this morning, uh, this group, us assembled here together, to disclose by way of a show of hands, how many of you have ever prayed, wished, or otherwise strained for a mirror? It's probable that nearly every hand in this room would go up. Regardless of each of our specific beliefs on the validity or the frequency of miracles amongst God's people and in his church today, I suspect most of us, if not every single one of us, has likely concluded that a miracle was the only way out of a certain circumstance or a certain situation at one time or another. Life's full of setbacks. It's full of sorrow, it's full of loss, it's full of illness, it's full of pain, and it's even unfortunately full of death. And some of these situations are so beyond our strength, as you know, or ability to solve, or beyond the strength or ability of those who love us to solve, or beyond the strength or ability of our employers, or our psychologists, or our bankers, or our doctors to solve, that a miracle is seemingly the only hope. Even possible today, is that some of us gathered here, right now, are in a situation emotionally, physically, financially, relationally, that seem so impossible that a miracle is the only option. We're waiting for it. All of this to say, miracles, at least the experience of feeling like we need one, is not foreign to any of us. So today, as we jump back into Acts, we're jumping into a book that is full of stories of the miraculous, stories of miracles of, of God's help for impossible situations. And yes, of course, it's about the expansion of the church and, and, and the inauguration of, of the, the new kingdom of God, we could say, through the Holy Spirit and his unique ministry. But a lot of it happened in very miraculous, very unique ways. And so we could spend the whole sermon now just talking about that. Oh, wow, Acts is full of miracles. Let's talk about miracles. The particulars, the whens, hows, are they valid? Have you ever experienced one? How can we know more miracles? But I think Acts offers actually something better than that. Better than just a general survey of the miracle, I think that it gives us an opportunity to explore the results of miracles in the lives of those who were witnesses to what God did for us. Or maybe part of the journey as we walk through a tough season or tough circumstance. And that's going to bring us really to our focus today, which is this, that sometimes the biggest miracle is actually not our breakthrough. It's the effect our breakthrough has on those who see God's grace, mercy, provision, kindness, power, etc. at work for us. We could say it's the overflow of those works of grace. So our text this morning is Acts chapter 16, 25 through 34. Uh, before we jump into the specific verses and read them together, I'm just going to give you a little context of what we're going to dive into today. So if you're familiar with the book of Acts, uh, at this point, uh, Paul and Barnabas have uh, broken up. They are at odds. And after their breakup, Paul connects with Silas. And Silas and Paul head off on a journey of ministering through various locations, various cities. And so in our particular story, they are in Philippi, a city that is now, uh, it's in modern Greece. And over the course of a few days while they're here, these men are harassed by a slave girl who is possessed by an evil spirit that has enabled her uh, to predict the future. And this special skill has created a very lucrative business for her owners. People can pay, have their fortune told, they make money off of it. And so one day on the way to the place of prayer, Paul has had enough of this disruptive spirit, ultimately. And the harassment that, that it's bringing towards Paul and towards Silas, and so he casts the demon out. Well, 
Paul's intervention then upsets the owners of this slave who realize their business has now been lost. And so they drag Paul and Silas before the authorities and then even the magistrate, and that leads them to being severely flogged and then imprisoned with the charge of being a social disturbance. The jailer is ordered to guard them very closely, which he does by placing them in like the inner cell of the prison, like the maximum security area of the prison, and he fastens their feet into the stocks. So they are locked up, and they are in the maximum security cell. Seems like a bit of a, um, you know, exaggerated punishment, we could say, but that's what happens. So this is where we're going to jump into the text. Paul and Silas wounded and bound in the center of prison. 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized the jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So this story is one that's fairly popular in Sunday school. We could say it makes the Sunday school circuit. Uh, usually as, you know, a picture kind of like this. The Adventures of Paul, prison break. And the lesson in Sunday school usually focuses on the miraculous jailbreak of Paul and Silas. Uh, the simple Sunday school uh, application is, you know, God rescues his people. We can trust God, and when we're in tough circumstances, if we pray and you know, we turn our hearts to God, he will deliver us from the challenge. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. That's certainly a truth of this story, but there is, of course, much more to this story than just the deliverance of Paul and Silas. The story, as I've alluded to, is a story about the overflow of God's blessing all over the prison. So we're going to consider this together first, and this won't be all that surprising to you, but we're going to work through it. The tough circumstance in this story was a platform for God's glory. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. So I suspect at one time or another, when you've been in a tough circumstance, you've heard someone say to you, I know this is tough with what you're going through, but just remember, God's going to be glorified through this. And it's usually well-meaning, and it's true, but it's not always all that comfort. Not at least at first. But we can't avoid what this account says, whether that's a comforting truth in our moments of anguish or not, because this story does offer us the reminder that sometimes our life is used by God in ways that are painful to us, but bring glory to him. And this is really important, supremely important, because it's not always our most natural response to want to flow like this. Well, I'm just grateful that God's going to use my life for whatever he sees fit, even if it hurts. And so I think at times the, the, the degree we could say of glory that is given to God depends a little bit on our response to the season we find ourselves in. Maybe more specifically, are we people who are surrendering to God's will and choosing to remain faithful even when life is the worst? Uh, Pete Greig, who's sort of an expert on prayer, says this little line, I like it. He says, faith is God's gift to us, but faithfulness is ours to him. Faith is God's gift to us, but faithfulness is ours to him. Faithfulness, loyalty, we could say, sanctified loyalty, 
is what we give to God, especially in those circumstances when faithfulness is hard to keep, like flogging and imprisonment, for example. Now, faithfulness may look different depending on the moment. It might be just a deep, deep heart allegiance for Jesus uh, that, that may put us in physical harm or our reputation at risk with somebody that might you know, matter to us, so to speak, but we remain faithful even though, I mean, martyrs would be the extreme version of that deep heart allegiance even when their life is in jeopardy. Uh, faithfulness might look like a tremendous commitment to a specific call of God on our life to do something sacrificially or go somewhere challenging or love somebody who's not that easy to love. And faithfulness may also look like prayer and praise in the middle of a prison cell with a bleeding back. Faithfulness might look like prayer and praise when groaning and cursing are the more natural reaction. And it's this type of faithfulness that we see at work here in the lives of Paul and Silas. Well, sitting there beaten, wounded, and chained in a stinky, dark prison cell, all for doing God's will and delivering a woman from evil, proclaiming the gospel. Like, certainly they must have wanted to have you know, some conversation with God and ask a couple questions. I think we can understand this, and yet that's not what we find here. We find that they are praying and singing. Even in this moment of literal physical pain, shredded backs, aching bones, and a circumstance that they did not deserve, that does not make sense, Paul and Silas pray and sing hymns. They're not groaning about the horrible situation, they're singing. They're not blaming and cursing people, they're blessing the name of God. And these prayers aren't quiet or in their head. They're not, you know, folded hands and bowed heads. Nor are their songs quiet. The hymns aren't sung in quiet whispers or just in the spirit. Rather, in the middle of the night, in complete darkness, Paul and Silas pray and sing loud enough that all the other prisoners start listening to them. All things considered, it's no wonder that these other inmates were curious to pay attention to what these guys both had to say, but even what they were doing. You know, we know what this is like. It's not particularly, if we're being honest, compelling to see someone bless God in their life as exactly as they want it to be. Like, oh, my vacation's going absolutely perfectly. God bless God. <laughs> That's true. I mean, bless God in, in, in the good and the bad, the mountains and the valleys. I'm not, of course, bless Him in all seasons. But there is something far more compelling about the person who is blessing God when life is not as they planned it. These are the stories we remember. These are the stories that make it in our books, become our, our, our rememberings of, of great heroes of the faith outside of the Bible and in the Bible. It's the people that felt they experienced the worst and remained faithful when. That's compelling. Trial will always be a platform for witness. That's never a question. The question is, what will our witness say? And what will our witness say about God? Our circumstance will always draw an audience. Always. And so then it's, what does that platform invite us to preach, so to speak? Either we're going to bless, we're going to curse, or we're going to give the lukewarm indifferent silence and say not much. For Paul and Silas, the prayers and songs of praise were a message of God's goodness and God's grace. They weren't singing the blues. Paul wasn't on harmonica and Silas bringing the sorrow. This is a hymn about God's goodness. Hymns are, are songs about his character and his works. Hymns are songs where we go, I know it's true about you, and I've even seen it in my life. Furthermore, the tense of the verb being used here, singing hymns, says this wasn't one song. They didn't sing Jesus loves me and then go to sleep. This is a continuous action. It's an indifferent tense. It's, it's not specific. It just kept going over a period of time. Now, church, please notice how this circumstance creates this platform. And the prayers and the hymns give the audience a testimony to the goodness of God 
rather than to the failure of God, the selfishness of God, the indifference of God. Next, individual breakthrough becomes a community event. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. What a great verse. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. So we know when God blesses people, he always blesses in such a way that it runs over. Uh, the storehouses that are our lives cannot ultimately contain all of God's blessing and just seal it up. A vacuum seal God's blessing for myself. It always leaks. It always overflows. always spills. And this is kind of a fun exercise, actually. Even now, I mean, I won't give you a lot of time because I'm going to keep talking, but try to think of a time when God did something very unique for you, a real work of grace in your life, and that didn't matter to someone else. Whether it's your spouse, your parents, your best friend, your congregation, whoever it might be, a time when God did something unique for you, and that's as far as it went. I don't know that I can think of a single time. And this is certainly the case in the deliverance of Paul and Silas from prison. Luke tells us that this earthquake causes these prison doors to go open, and Paul and Silas are busted out. But they're not the only ones. As we read here in verse 26, everybody's chains break. The blessing of God, his care for Paul and Silas, overflows all over the prison. And interestingly, like the blessing comes by way of an earthquake. Um, I wouldn't often suggest that earthquakes are synonymous with blessings. And yet, here it is. Now, it's worth mentioning that earthquakes are common in the area of Philippi. So an earthquake in this moment actually isn't all that unusual. There were probably more unusual ways God, had inter God could have intervened. I mean, we even think of Peter, where he's broken out of prison by an angel, like leading him right out of there. This is more just like a natural occurrence. But the timing and the effect of this earthquake were certainly special. It happens at a perfect time for a jailbreak. And interestingly, this earthquake, unlike many earthquakes, brings life rather than destruction or death. Now, it's possible we could sit here and say, oh, I think that the, the, the details about this prison breakout are just lucky coincidences. It was probably going to just happen anyways. Maybe they didn't uh, build the prison on a strong enough foundation. So the earthquake came and it just, it was easy to break the bars open. And I get that. I think that when we operate from, you know, skepticism... We want to see things from that sort of logical, rational, let's explain away the miracle and find why it's just an accident. But I think those of us who want to lean towards faith or do lean towards faith will see these details, these likely works of a natural occurrence as actually the works of a gracious, powerful, and sovereign God. I think that if we look at this with the lens of faith, we want to see that God works all things together, even Philippian earthquakes and prison breakouts for good. So in the case of this work of God, Paul and Silas are set free to continue their gospel work. The jailer comes to saving faith, which we're going to talk about in a moment, and all the other prisoners have their chains broken. And so we could talk about whether these criminals deserve to go free or not. <laughs> Those of us with the justice bent probably think, well, that's not good. They're criminals. But such is the nature of God's blessing. It shines on the righteous and the unrighteous. And it is certainly true that no one has ever been deserving to have their chains loosened by God's grace. <laughs> and yet it happened to us. And that's what happens in Philippi, all because a common earthquake accomplished a not-so-common blessing for two prisoners and an entire prison community. Something easily labeled as coincidence was an overflowing blessing 
in the hand of a sovereign God. Now, this reminds me of a famous story as I was thinking about this this week. Some of you will be familiar with this story. It's one of those stories where I probably already shared it here. I just don't remember. But it's a story where we sort of see something like this, where the prayers of like one are answered, but it overflows and it touches many more. So in the 1800s, there's this guy named George Mueller. He's a German, and he's a missionary in Bristol, England. Uh, he has a beautiful beard and fantastic haircut, and I also like that he matched his eyebrows to the whole set. Uh, he looks very sharp. And a nice uh, uh, clerical collar that is almost like a fashionable turtleneck. I appreciate that also. <laughs> but uh, this guy lives this life that is full of testimony after testimony after testimony of God's miraculous provision through what we would call coincidence. And so a highlight of his ministry, this is one of the best things about George Mueller, is he resolves at the beginning of the work of his ministry to never ask anyone for a dollar or ever take on any kind of loan that every single cent, every single need for the ministry of caring for orphans would become completely by God's provision. And he does it. That becomes truly the legacy of George Mueller. Now, one story dealing with that conviction is a story about a miraculous provision for breakfast. And so this is what happens. Uh, the children, 300 of them, are dressed and they're ready for school. And there's no breakfast. There's nothing in the orphanage. There's not even milk to give them something to drink. There's nothing. And so George is convinced, as he has so many times before, that God will provide again. And so he has the kids come in to the dining hall, sit down at the table, and they pray and thank God for their food. Within minutes, the baker knocks on the door. Mr. Mueller, he said, last night I could not sleep. Somehow I knew that you would need bread this morning. I got up and baked three batches for you. I will bring it in. Soon there was another knock at the door. It was the milkman. His cart had broken down in front of the orphanage. The milk would spoil by the time the wheel was fixed. So he asked George if he could use some free milk. George smiled as the milkman brought in 10 large cans of milk. It was just enough for 300 thirsty children. Point person of this miracle is George Mueller. He's the leader. He's the one responsible for this work for these kids. He's bearing the burden, and it is his conviction that God will provide every single time. And God responds to him, and we can imagine how his heart left, and how he was reassured, and how he celebrated the goodness of God again, but it leaks over. And 300 kids are fed. And whatever staff and his spouse who are also present see it. And they are part of this. And here we are like 200 years later in Yellowknife, Canada, still talking about George Mueller and the miraculous breakfast. God's blessing touches not just one, but it will always touch the community. Finally, breakthrough doesn't just bless, but it set the stage for other people's salvation. So the jailer woke up, and he saw that the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. So there's a lot covered there. And I want to review these highlights because... Almost every sentence here is like, wow, wow, wow. So Paul and Silas and all the prisoners don't run away. That's the first like, wow. They don't take off. The chains are broken, the prison doors are open, and yet nobody leaves. It's the most obedient 
prison community in the history of prison. And this is, it's an interesting action because it displays the missionaries' respect for civil order in contrast to the charge against them, which was that they were social disturbances. They're like, we're actually so in favor of civil order that we'll just wait for the next step. The jailer, uh, he doesn't know that they haven't left. He assumes, of course, like probably we would, that they've all taken off. And so he panics. Believing that these prisoners have escaped, and, and this we don't know this for sure, but it is possible that this jailer is also a slave. And this, this is his job. And that he is going to be so severely mistreated for this that he draws his own sword with the intention to take his own life. Believing that suicide would be better than the certain punishment he would face for the escape of this prison. So Paul sees somehow and tells him to stop doing what he's doing and he reassures him that nobody's left. Jailer asks for the lights to come on or as he would have said it, light the torches. And then he falls trembling at their feet. Then he addresses them as sirs. Other translations would, would say gentlemen. And that's actually a noteworthy detail. The word... Uh, in Greek, that's being translated here as, as sirs or gentlemen, um, can be used as nothing more than just a you know, respectful address. But it also may indicate that the jailer sensed, he perceived that something extraordinary has happened and it is somehow linked to those two men. I suspect it's the latter. I don't know why else you fall trembling at Paul and Silas' feet unless you think they are part of something wild. And then comes his question. The most important question, what must I do to be saved? Now, the exact motivation or meaning behind that question is a little bit murky. Uh, it's possible that this jailer is like suffering from religious terror that he actually believes that he has aroused the wrath of the gods, or even the high god who is connected to Paul and Silas, and he's like, oh my gosh, I have made the gods very mad. What am I going to do to get out of this? And it is also possible that he at some point, maybe from the slave girl, maybe from something else Paul said, just has now that longing in his heart. That I want what you have. I want to know who you know. I want to be saved like you are. In either case, Paul and Silas give him the answer. He must trust personally in Jesus, and he would be saved with his household. After that, I love this, they more fully speak the word of the Lord to him, fully opening up the whole picture of the gospel to him and his household. He responds to what he heard. Luke tells us that not only does he believe, he repents. And then as a sign of his contrition, he washes the wounds of Paul and Silas. You know what's amazing about this, and like, we can't prove this. I read one commentator this week that said, it is possible that he was, after washing their wounds, then baptized in the same water that he used to wash their wounds. Which is just, I mean, to use a not super sophisticated term, that's kind of gnarly. And then finally, what do they do? They share a meal in celebration of what happened in his life and the life of his family. That is a busy evening. Full day of ministry. Yeah, all afternoon, exactly. So what's a practical takeaway from this? I think it's this, that when God works in our lives, his glory and his power is revealed, and that's fantastic. We always want our life to glorify God. We always want our life to magnify his significance, his perfection, his goodness, and his love. But more than just, wow, yeah, God exists, we want people to come to believe, to repent and be saved as we are. Which means we want, I think, at a reasonable level, to let people know when we're going through challenging times. So that they can also come to see God's power and love that saves, not just exists. And why that would be a takeaway for a church and a group of people that I know are intelligent, and this might just seem to be so simple, 
Why I have to bring that up is because in North America, people tend to value privacy and discretion over disclosure and vulnerability. And so our struggles are often kept very quiet. Uh, you know, interestingly, there's this habit in North America. I mean, it's been around as long as I've been around. But even when we'll say so-and-so needs prayer, we won't even always use their name. We'll, 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 we'll you know, go to the intercessor group and we'll say, I can't say who. But somebody just got diagnosed with cancer this week. Meanwhile, the person's like sitting like four seats over from them on Sunday. When life gets hard, we tend to close up the metaphorical curtains of the window into our life. And I understand this. Like sometimes privacy is very necessary. Discretion is wise. I get that. The world is full of gossip. It's full of judgment. And it isn't always wise to share all the details of what we might be going through. But I do think that it is true. And I hope we want to be reminded that when people know what someone is facing, then they also get to see how God intervenes. How he extends grace. How he shows his power. And Again, so beautifully, how they remained faithful to him in their valley. To a point where others may come and say, how do I have what you have? How can I live like that? How can I know God like that? Church, our chapters in the story that is our life have impact. And I know it's not our favorite thing to hear, but often, as I've said, the hard ones more than the sunshiny ones. We're quick to talk about our vacations. We're quick to show our pictures of the highlights of our weddings and our grandchildren's birth and all these amazing things. And rightly so, God is so kind. But there are times where the pain needs to come forward so that God's glory can be shared. Sometimes the testimony is actually the journey rather than just wait until we get to the end and then we'll share the testimony because it worked out. Sometimes the testimony is just what happened in the middle those testimonies of the sustaining grace of God and the unwavering faithfulness of someone who didn't get the answer they prayed for. Those stories are every bit as much our own little prison breaks, we could say. And they lead other prisoners who may be bound up in similar situations to say, how can I find that? How can I have that? How can I know that? So dear church, I would encourage you gently, with wisdom and discretion, do live your stories before others. Live your faithfulness in front of others. Because we just never know what stage may be being set for somebody else's salvation. So to put all the bow, a bow on all of this, I know, and you know, and this is not new, sometimes waiting for God's answer is very challenging, very difficult. We have felt beaten, we've felt bloodied, we've felt bound by tough circumstances. This is common to all of us. But maybe we can agree today that to live the whole story, as we've been talking about living the whole story, not just I'm saved, but also I am being sanctified, living the whole story, is to live with an assurance that both the character, the nature of how we wait, and the breakthrough himself, itself, has far greater effect than just us. It ripples, sometimes for a very long time. And so today, if you're in a moment that feels hard, confusing, or maybe even hopeless, I think only by the Holy Spirit's work in your life, you can be encouraged in this. You can be encouraged today that your story's not over, God's not forgotten you, and it may just be that that season you're in will come to be what God used most to point others to himself and even lead them to salvation. I also would say amongst the encouragement, also be challenged with the reminder that how we wait does matter. We can pray, we can praise, or we can curse the situation and other people. But that is not without effect, for better or worse. 
Because circumstance almost always includes an audience. The nature of our waiting matters. Finally, remember that our breakthrough isn't the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle of all is any time someone comes to save and pay. When someone repents and knows the freedom that is the forgiveness of sins, that is always the greatest miracle. As Jesus said to the paralyzed man, so you know that I have the authority to forgive your sins, let me heal your body. The greatest miracle was not his healed body, it was his healed soul. So as we come to the communion table this morning, I want to make sure that you see the gospel marveling in this story, because there was a whole other sermon that we could have done just on gospel illusion in this story. So first of all, we know that Jesus, our Savior, was delivered from the prison of death. And when he was, our shackles came, to by his, came free by his victory. The jailer was going to fall on his own sword and pay the penalty for seemingly his own failure. Instead, Paul and Silas told him he didn't have to die for this error. Someone's already done that. The jailer washed the wounds of Paul and Silas. In a way, we could say the wounded became the healer, and then the wounded become the healers again. This reciprocal wounded healer taking care of each other. And finally, he prepares a meal of celebration for his salvation. One day, those of us who have remained faithful will participate in the wedding feast with the bride, and he's united. We are united to him, the bridegroom. And at that point, the lifelong celebration begins. Joy that we are saved. We have plenty to remember today. What a story that we have been invited to live in.